My name is Vance Raines. I'm the lead pastor at First United Methodist Church of Orlando, and I'm joined today by our own executive pastor, Reverend Emily Sterling Strongman, and Helen Ride of the United Methodist Reconciling Ministries Network. For many years, First Church Orlando has been striving to be a welcoming place for all people, including members of the LGBTQ community. For decades, First Church has hosted a group from PFLAG, the parents and friends of lesbians and gays. First Church responded quickly, of course, to the tragedy at Pulse Nightclub, offering hospitality and care to those who were victims and the families and traumatized by the event. And our own new Sunday school class has been a member of the Reconciling Ministry Network for many years. In recent years, a group within First Church called Forward Together has been working toward making First Church an increasingly affirming place for all people and exploring how we might become a reconciling church. And today's conversation with Helen is part of that work. So Helen Ride, welcome to the First Church Orlando uh, podcast and video cast. Tell us about yourself and the Reconciling Ministries Network. Well, firstly, so grateful for this invitation and for this time to, to chat with you all. So yeah, my name is uh, Helen Ride. I work as an organizer with Reconciling Ministries Network. I grew up uh, in the Southeast, as I like to say, but it's a different Southeast. I grew up in the Southeast of England, not the Southeast of America. Um, and the, dif the differences are vast, but um, I had uh, a church background in my late teens and early twenties that was very evangelical and conservative. And um, my own journey took me through this kind of struggle between my faith and my sexual orientation and my gender identity. And um, I actually landed the United Methodist Church for me, which was in Provincetown, Massachusetts, which is the first United Methodist Church that I attended, um, was a place where I actually was able to reconcile my sexuality and my faith. So for me, the United Methodist Church has been a huge gift. And I've been fortunate over the last uh, eight years now to actually be working with Reconciling Ministries Network, which is the organization within the United Methodist Church that has been working for over 30 years now to try and help us navigate this change from a position of really discrimination against LGBTQ people into a place of full affirmation. And um, I could go into more detail about the numbers and the whys and the wherefores if that's of interest. But the primary thing to say, I think about RMN's work is that we have sought to um, change the institution of the church. So change the rules of the church, which we, believed to be discriminatory and harmful through expanding and growing a grassroots network of individuals, of small groups, of churches, of campus ministries, and now we have regional groups that are willing to declare and affirm this is the kind of church we want to be a part of. This is the kind of church that we want to help grow, and they become affiliated with RMN, and we now have over 1,300, I believe, yes, over 1,300 reconciling groups across the US and even now more globally, we just added our second reconciling church in Africa, which is remarkable. Yeah, so that's RMN, that's the work I'm involved in and I love to do it. As I like to say, it makes sense of the whole of the rest of my life. <laughs> you know, my journey, I've been able to translate that into, into the work that I do now and, and uh, I find that really meaningful. Oh, that's beautiful. Helen, uh, this is not your first contact with First Church Orlando. Um, no. Can you tell us a little bit about your history with First Church and uh, previous conversations that you've been a part of within groups of the church? Yeah, so I I don't know exactly how long ago it is, but I'm pretty sure it's John Richard who was the person who uh, I first connected with uh, at uh, First Church. And I remember getting a tour of your facility and uh, my goodness, what an extraordinary building you have. I was mostly blown away by the room for the flowers, but also by the ministry that is done through that room. At one point I was like a room for flowers, but then I'm like, wow, what fantastic way to share the gifts of the church with the community. So yes, so I've uh, been with you. I've, I've uh, met with uh, the folks from the new class. I've had conversations, phone calls and different things at different times. Um, with folks in your church and uh, just really, I'm just very grateful for the, for the fact that it's been a journey that, you know, started off maybe fairly small with a small group that was really committed to it. And they, I mean, the new class have been really committed to this for a very long time. And they have, they have faithfully worked 
to draw others into the conversation and, and help the conversation grow within the congregation and not in a way, and I, I really affirm this, this way of doing things, right, is by inviting people in rather than forcing people forward. The whole, the whole purpose or the nature of reconciling work is bringing people together in a way that is uh, relational, that builds connection, doesn't pull people apart. And I really think um, your process at, at First Church has really embodied that value. And uh, I'm thrilled to be this little part of it now, <laughs> part of the journey now is, uh, you know, it's really great. So I'm, um, yeah, very grateful for the work you all have done faithfully over a long time. I always say to people, this isn't a race. Mm -hmm. This isn't about who can get across the finish line first. This is about doing the work deeply meaningfully properly in relationship with one another so mm -hmm. i think you're doing a great job at that well thank you helen i mean you are segueing right into my next question uh to talk a little bit more about what does it mean uh to become a reconciling congregation uh what does that process look like what does it really mean um to be about the work of reconciliation how does it change us both as individuals and as a as a body um, as a community of faith yeah, I think, so my feeling about the, the journey towards reconciliation is that um, it's helping a church take a journey towards what it really means to love our neighbours. Like it's shining a spotlight on who really are our neighbours and are we truly loving and welcoming, accepting and affirming all of them. So I, I feel as though, um, and also I want to just mention this, that um, this past year for RMN, we have really taken an, another real deep soul searching look at and are continuing to examine the ways in which our work with churches and groups to help them become fully LGBTQ affirming has to include all the different intersections of injustice that people experience within their identities, which isn't necessarily just about them being queer, right? That we have to be addressing uh, racial justice. We have to be addressing uh, immigration justice, economic justice, and so on, if we are going to be fully leaning into this work um, in a complete in a complete way. Um, so I think um, what it means in terms of actually affiliating with Reconciling Ministers Network within the larger United Methodist Church is our records, and my dog Bella would like to join in this conversation, but I'm going to try and ignore her. Um, what we are what we're seeking to do in the United Methodist Church is we are we are mir we are mirroring the idea of connectionalism within the United Methodist Church, right? So one of the things that sets us apart as United Methodists is the fact that we value connection. I think that's one of the reasons why this whole journey towards becoming a more inclusive church has taken so long, because we're not prepared to just set that connection aside mm -hmm. and say it doesn't matter anymore, because it does matter. And so Reconciling Ministers Network is a connection of churches and groups and individuals that have this common um, perspective and, and faith and desire to see uh, a church be built, to see a church emerge that is fully LGBTQ inclusive and affirming, and that we're doing it in connection with the great connection. So it's not about connecting and, and moving outside of who we already are, right? It's about connecting within the connection. And that's a really important part of, of, I think, what people, I hope people understand, because that's not always how RMN has been spoken about, <laughs> right, by others who might not agree with us. But a core part of our values is that we, we are in connection within the connection. It has never been about, you know, come and follow us to this new place, this new land of inclusion or whatever. It's about, no, we're in this journey together. We don't get to sort of say we're not part of you anymore. We're in this journey together. And so for, for First Church and other churches like it that are, that are undertaking this journey, I, I think I, I really hope people understand that that's what it's about. It's not about, uh, about setting yourself aside as or better than or anything like that. It's about just saying, you know what, this is really, we feel passionately about it. These are the values of our church. This is, this is the kind of church we want to be building and we're doing it arm in arm with others who are staying in the connection and helping the conversation move forward um, as a denomination. I feel like I didn't maybe fully answer your question, but. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> you answered what we needed to hear. 
<laughs> well, I just, I think it's so important. Uh, people sometimes think that becoming a reconciling church is setting themselves apart from or somehow against. Mm -hmm. And I think this, none of this is against, right? Even the idea of changing the book of discipline isn't against the denomination. We've changed the book of discipline every four years for decades of centuries, right? I mean, that's part of our process of going on to perfection. It's part of what we embrace as Wesleyan Christians is this idea that there's always more to learn, to discern, to understand about what it means to live out our faith. And so this is part of that to me, yeah. Well, and I'm noticing uh, words that, that we're using in this conversation. And uh, obviously I think we're, we're all learning uh, the, the importance of the language we use in, in lots of ways. Um, I, I hear sometimes very good-hearted, uh, well-intentioned Christians uh, say things like, um, well, I, I accept everyone, or I, I think my church accepts everyone. Um, but then I hear other people use the word of affirming, that we're, that, that we're an affirming church. Um, and then today we're, we're adding the word uh, reconciling. Um, mm -hmm. I, I just wonder if maybe you could uh, offer a little perspective on, on those words in particular, being an, an accepting Christian, an affirming Christian, or, or, or being a reconciling person. Mm. So I, I would say that affirming and reconciling are very connected. I'm, I'm not sure there's, there's a lot of similarities there. The, the, the difference really occurs between this idea of welcoming and accepting versus affirming and reconciling. And the, the, the idea, like nobody wants to think of themselves as a Christian that doesn't welcome people. Like even in our core, we kind of get a sense, well, that's just not right. That's not what Jesus was about. But there is something different about saying to someone, you're welcome here. And then when you, dis when, when you dive deeper into knowing who the person is and, and uh, maybe how the, their sexual orientation or their gender identity, that suddenly there's a layer of, well, actually, hang on a minute. Because of this, we're going to have to treat you this way. So you're welcome. You can come. You can join our Bible study class. You can sing in the choir, you know. And I don't believe this, by the way, is true of, of First Church. But there are churches who will say that. In fact, I've had conversations with pastors who have prided themselves on the fact that they, they've got LGBTQ people in their choir. They've got LGBTQ people in their Bible studies. But when it comes to, for example, leading a Bible study or being a leader in, a, uh, in the children's work or, or youth work or, you know, uh, being um, in the trustees or on the PPRC or what, what, what are the other way, ways of leading in the church we have, that there's a barrier. So in other words, you're welcome to a point. And so I think that's the differential for me between welcoming and accepting. And really what it comes down to is this. It comes down to, do we believe that LGBTQ people are fully human like any other kind of person, no matter their sexual orientation or gender identity? Because as soon as we put a block on someone or a barrier up, and it's because of their sexual orientation and gender identity, we're essentially saying, you know, you're okay up to a point, but this part of your identity sets you apart and means that you can't do this, this, or this. And in the United Methodist Church, obviously the key things are, you can't get married here. We don't really affirm your relationship. We, we, we're not gonna support you um, honoring your relationship before God and before the community. Or God may have given you gifts and graces, but they can't be worked out in ministry as a, as a pastor in the church, as an elder or a deacon in the church. So that's 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 the that's the line, right? That's the difference there. And I think when it comes down to it, when people kind of unpeel the layers, it really comes down to are LGBTQ people fully human like everybody else? And reconciling and affirming Christians would say, absolutely, a hundred percent. You know, I'm left-handed. Um, that doesn't make me any less human than my right-handed siblings, right? Uh, I have brown hair going a little gray. That doesn't make me any less human <laughs> than my blonde hair or whatever. So that 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 my sexual orientation and my gender identity doesn't make me any less human, any less fully human uh, than anyone else. And that's what that's that's the difference of point, I think. And I, I, sometimes I think people can get un 
a little uncomfortable with that because that kind of will bring them up short and like, gosh, am I really, is that really what I'm saying when I say I want to welcome everyone, but I'm not so comfortable with this? Mm -hmm. Am I really saying that I don't believe this person is fully like that is that's an uncomfortable point but I think change only comes through moments of discomfort right we have to have that moment of oh hang on a sec I don't know if I want to be a person who believes that that doesn't feel comfortable to me and that's sometimes the moment which helps us move forward and to change right yeah thank you for that clarification I think that's I think that's helpful for all of us yeah so the conversation you know that we've been having with you, kind of how we've gotten to know you has been specifically around asking the question, you know, what what would it look like for First Church Orlando to become a reconciling church and, and affiliate with the, the Reconciling Ministries Network? Um, we're, we're in a, a strange moment in the United Methodist Church that mm -hmm. you've already referenced. Uh, many, many pretty confidently believe that we're about to split and that that more theologically conservative traditional churches are likely to leave and start another denomination. And so, and so the question might be raised, you know, since that's already happening, um, what, what's the point of becoming a reconciling church now in light of that? Um, mm. and, and so I'm curious your perspective on that. What, what, what's the point um, if, if, if it's kind of sorting itself out anyway? Mm. So I, I yes, I, I hear that um, concern, and I, I've you know that's not an unusual concern for people to have. So folks should feel good. I mean, you know, it's okay to be thinking those things, right? So, but I think that there's a couple of things. One is just from the perspective of being a church, right? Never mind United Methodist Church. Never mind, um, you know, what denomination or whatever. For the most part, for LGBTQ people, the concept of walking over the threshold of a church, which I know not people aren't doing right now, but <laughs> when we do that again, <laughs> the concept of walking over the threshold of a church is one that's undertaken in fear and trembling because so often there is no certainty about whether they will be accepted fully um, as who they are in that, in that church. So simply by being a church, a Christian church in the United States of America, I think... Um, requires us to consider what are we saying about who we are to those who are outside of our doors. Um, so I think that's a reason and that's outside of the denomination. People need to know how they're going to be greeted and welcomed and affirmed inside the doors before they get there. And becoming a reconciling church is one way uh, of, of doing that. I would say from the denomination point of view, if you look at other mainline denominations who have taken this journey towards a more inclusive stance, there has been a, an ongoing journey that carries on behind that. So let us say, for example, you know, we end up actually having a general conference. Votes are actually taken. We, we maybe, you know, pass the protocol or we regionalize the church. We have a church in the United States that is able to change the book of discipline. The fact of the matter is that most of our churches that will be in that denomination will not have done the work of determining how are they going to be around this conversation? And this is this has been played out in Presbyterian churches, in Lutheran churches, and so on, right? Is that there is still a process of churches having to say, not only has our denomination said this, but we are firmly behind it, and this is what we're about. And I still think that will be part of the journey for United Methodist churches going forward, is the need to um, be clear and public about the fact that, yeah, this conversation has happened here, and this is where we stand um and so i anticipate that um the idea of reconciling churches is going to continue um i have a colleague that works for more like presbyterians which is a con an organization very similar to rmn within the pc usa church and they continue even several years now since the denominational change they continue to have churches that are doing this work and continue to have churches that are aligning themselves and saying yes we're a more like church because we've done this work so I don't see this as being um, an either or kind of thing. Or I, and I, I don't see it either as being a wait and see thing, right? I know there's some kind of like, can't we just wait and see what happens? Well, I don't think so. <laughs> I think it's really important. And I would say this too, First Church Orlando in the, in the Florida conference, you know, it's a significant church. 
and your leaders. Uh, and so I believe that the path you've taken is a leadership, is taking a leadership path, is taking a leadership role within the conference to say, this is how a large church like ours, a diverse church like ours can navigate this con conversation and come through to this point and this perspective. And I think that is also an important role to be considering as the church considers the next steps here. Um, some people, you know, lay the path for others to follow. Mm. And, uh, and within Florida, we have, you know, a bunch of reconciling co uh, churches now, but not that many. Um, and so I think it would be um, really helpful. It kind of gives permission to other churches to say, oh, okay, we should do that too. I, I, I just want to thank you for saying that. And that's not the first time you said that to me. And um, that, that reminder of the importance of First Church Orlando to uh, accept the mantle of leadership, um, mm -hmm. particularly uh, on, on behalf of, of folks in the LGBTQ community oh. and to lead the way for other churches. That I, I think I think that's a high calling and um, and thank you for the challenge and that that you see us in that light. Um, it's good for us to be reminded. Yeah, it's important. I mean, you you have been exhibiting that like this step would not be the the you know, it would be a step in the journey that the response you all made to the pulse tragedy was um, outstanding and, and, and all the things that one would hope for a church to do in that in that in the light of that you all did um and so um this isn't maybe even going to be the most important step you take on the journey of being leading in that way but i think it is a step in the journey of leading in that way well i wonder for those who aren't as familiar with the conversation if, if you could just kind of in simple terms just what what are the steps of becoming a, a reconciling, you know, the official steps of becoming a, a yeah. reconciling group or church? Yeah, sure. So the 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 official steps are so there are like some five final steps. They're like this is the final bit, but really it's the preamble to the final bit that's important. And really that's the piece that you all are already doing, which is engaging in congregation wide deep conversation about what does it mean to welcome affirm, fully affirm LGBTQ people in our congregation. So the education component, and this is probably a part of that, right, is, is a really important piece. So once, once that piece is done, there are several steps towards the end of the process. One that we strongly recommend, and I, I don't recall off the top of my head whether we've talked about this before, but we really strongly recommend taking straw polls around the vote. So in other words, that you don't have a final vote until you're ready for a final vote. Mm -hmm. um, the straw poll is a way of really honoring the process and ensuring that everyone's questions are heard. So one of the things that we recommend is that language something along the lines of, if we were to vote to adopt this statement today and affiliate with Reconciling Ministries Network, would you vote yes or no? And if you would vote no, what are some what are some continuing concerns that you have that we haven't sufficiently addressed yet? So it's a way of gauging where people are at and it's a way of uh, another way of allowing people to ask questions, okay? And that, that, you know, depending on where that lands that you would then sort of wind back and do some more education potentially or, or so on. Um, you know, and some churches have done the straw poll two, three, four, five times. There's no, uh, again, this is not a race, right? This is about bringing as many people along as possible on the journey to a vote that says yes. And so that when you do finally take the vote, you've already taken enough votes to know what your vote, what the what the response is going to be. Because, because this is a relational process. This is not a, I wonder if we can win, right? This is not election night. <laughs> This is a journey that we take together and in full transparency of the journey we take together, where are we at right now? Okay, well, we just voted and we got this percentage that said yes, and this said no. We recommend at RMN that you have 75% of the church, active church members who affirm the decision. Um, it's not a simple majority. This should be, because when you're doing this, you're saying this is who we are. 
this is not this is who we aspire to be, but this is who we are. And so it's important to have a super majority of people. So you go through a series of straw poll votes, maybe one, maybe more than one. Then you do a final vote. The final vote, you're going to know what the result's going to be. Um, and uh, and then there's a uh, just a form to fill out and a photo to take. And we are we do um, encourage our reconciling churches to be financial supporters of RMN. We, it's not a requirement. There's no it's not a membership fee in that way, but we are very strongly dependent, increasingly dependent actually on our reconciling churches and individuals to support our work. Um, but it's not um, it's not a requirement, um, but it is a strongly we strongly encourage folks to do that. Um, I did I I wanted to mention one thing about the reconciling statement because when we launched Rooted and Rising, we did launch a new foundational reconciling statement that we're asking churches to adopt. Now, churches that have been in the process already and have been working with the statement. Um, we're working with them, providing it's a fully intersectional statement. In other words, providing it recognizes that LGBTQ people exist in all kinds of identities in the world. And that if we're not addressing those as well as LGBTQ identity, we're not doing the job fully. So one of the things I've been talking to churches about is the idea of, of crafting your own personalized statement and at the same time also affirming the RMN statement. So these two things don't have to necessarily be the same, but there is a need to affirm RMN statement in the process of, of affiliating with RMN. Um, we needed some kind of consistent uh, process and this is what we landed on. So um, mostly I have found actually that churches uh, are grateful to have some language that they can use. Recently, I was just on a call with one of our longstanding churches, uh, Dumbarton United Methodist in Washington DC. They've been a reconciling church for 34 years. And as part of their anniversary, they actually adopted and affirmed the new RMN statement, even though they've been a reconciling church for 34 years. So it's a journey we're, we're all on together. I think, I mean, if anything, the past year has taught us is just um, getting comfortable with the idea that we're constantly learning and constantly changing, right? <laughs> that we can't say at any point we arrived, even once you become a reconciling church, what does it mean to fully live into that, right? Um, that's that's something we're always working on. So those are the steps, a straw poll, as many as needed, a final vote, a moment of celebration. Um, there's a form to fill in and a photo to take and um, just prayerfully consider whether whether First Church could also be a financial support of RMN or, and or individuals within your congregation, uh, which we have many who are supporting us already. And we're grateful for that. Does that make sense? Does that generate any qu new questions or does that make sense? That, that makes perfect sense. Thank you. Okay, it does. Yeah. I love how, I mean, in doing those straw polls and kind of asking those questions, it really affirms what you've talked about, that the wanting to be a connection within a connection. <laughs> mm -hmm. what that means is that like, we're in this together and it's not about winners or losers. And exactly. it's not about, you know, um, yeah, we won, and uh, but it's about how are we living in relationship together. I mean, that's core to reconciliation. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, yeah, and I, one of the things to mention is that um, there's there's evidence that shows that even people who don't agree with the final vote, if they really feel that they have been heard and listened to through the process, that their concerns, differences of of, of belief have not been ignored or, or uh, you know, not taken seriously, that even though they may not agree with the final vote, they still feel knitted into their community and, and being a part of the community. And that's really important. You know, this isn't about, uh, this isn't about trying to separate people. This is about trying to keep people together and bring people together. And so, um, I think there's a lot of value in, in, in being slow and thoughtful about the process and bringing as many people along as possible and listening and answering as many questions as possible. Even if it feels like the same question over and over and over again, mm. totally fine, <laughs> totally fine. Yeah. That's good wisdom. That is good wisdom. Well, um, I'm trying to think. I, I think we've covered a lot of our questions in our conversation today. Vance, do you have any other questions you want to ask Helen? 
Uh, you know, the only question that comes to mind is, is what question didn't we ask, Helen? Is there anything that comes to mind that uh, you think we should know or the folks at First Church should hear? I don't, I don't have any, um, I don't think, I think you've, I, as I said at the beginning, you've, you've, you have been and demonstrated a very thoughtful, planned process, and you're continuing that journey, and I, I affirm it, that's exactly what I hope for, um, you know, I, again, it's not a race, <laughs> there's no prize for getting over the line within a month or a year or two years, you know, it's about the journey, because the journey changes us, the journey changes us as a congregation, as individuals, as how we are in our communities. This is all about at the end of the day, what kind of, you know, what kind of neighbors <laughs> does First Church want to be to its neighbors? And how can we be church mm -hmm. in this moment? And really, I mean, I've I've just was talking to some folks yesterday about this. The ability to keep people around a table and conversing, even in the midst of some difference, what a gift to our nation right now. Mm. right what a gift to never mind leadership in the Florida conference in the United Methodist Church what a gift more broadly to be a community that is committed to staying around the table amidst difference and continuing in relationship with one another I think that's a huge role that is much broader than reconciling that is much broader than uh United Methodism right it's about how are we going to be as mm. as neighbors in our communities um uh, you know, across all kinds of conversations. So I think that that is the bigger picture that's happening here for me as well in our in our churches that are engaging in this, that are not running away from the hard stuff, but are leaning into it. Um, I think it's a gift. I think it can change our communities. I think it can transform the world, which, as I believe, is one of the things United Methodists is supposed to be about. <laughs> right. I think it does it. I really do. And uh yeah, so I just want to encourage you and thank you and affirm the work you're doing. It's it's fantastic. Love the question. What kind of church does First Church want to be for its neighbors? That that can guide us in all the right ways. Absolutely. Guide us in this conversation, but guide us in all that we do as a church in, in ministry and mission and um, vision and kind of how we're living in relationship with each other inside our walls and beyond. <laughs> sure. For sure. Well, thank you, Helen. This conversation has been a delight. Um, thank you so much for your work with RMN, uh, for your work of organizing and, and outreach and, and just this kind of relationship building that you've done with us here at First Church, as well as um, other congregations and communities. Thank you for sharing your time and your wisdom with us today. Um, if anybody would like to learn more about RMN, um, how would they do so? Uh, so our website is rmnetwork.org. They can email me. I'm helen at rmnetwork.org. Uh, we have a Facebook page that has quite a lot of stuff going on, on it too. So yeah, please uh, encourage. I'm happy for you to send out my email address. If folks have got questions. If individual members within the congregation want to stay connected with Reconciling Ministries, you can become a Reconciling United Methodist as an individual. And you can do that on our website. There's there's a place to get involved tab and you can you can do that right there. So yeah, we'd love to have uh, more folks connected. I, Bella is desperate to be part of this conversation. I, I'm not sure how much of the noise is getting through, but she's like, let me join in. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's been so nice to talk oh, to yeah. you, Bella, today. Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank yeah. you. Thanks for the invitation. Appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you to our listeners uh, who will be joining us uh, today and in the weeks to come, hearing this conversation and reflecting on how, um, how we can move forward here at First Church. Thanks, Colin. Bye.